are you a cradle Catholic, Marie? Yeah. 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 I mean, one of ten. One of ten. I remember going to my mom and saying, Mom, I don't know what to do. We're going to Burger King and, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm not supposed to eat meat on Friday. What do I do? Did I ever tell you the story about um, when I was going to go into the convent? I had a boyfriend. It's my grandmother. I, I don't ever remember seeing her without a rosary in her hands. My mom was studying to be a nun. She was praying for that. My dad was in the priesthood and it was suggested he take a break. They met each other, got married right away, and immediately had five kids. I had my own car, and I was dating, you know, so I wasn't thinking convent at that point. And she said, well, Megan, it's, it's okay if you do eat me. As I was eating the burger, I was thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. Although children are pretty chaotic, <laughs> I've seen it all and know how to deal with it all, and I love it. I am a member of the Catholic Church and believe in the Catholic faith, so I try and adhere to it to the best of my ability. I give it room to breathe, and I hope it gives me room to breathe. I think people socially see Catholic women as just quiet and just do what they're told, and that's what nuns are. They wear their habits, and they're quiet, and their hands are folded. A calling is a summons of the heart and the way we choose to respond to it. It can arrive at any point in our lives to guide our choices or careers and it ultimately transforms us. Like many who hear it, Catholic women hear and answer their calls. In unexpected ways, Many have overcome stereotypes about their roles and importance in the church and have become leaders on the altar and activists on the streets. This is the story of such women and those who witness their example. It is about what they learn, how they transform and how rewarding it is to follow our own calling. We were kind of uh, kind of homeless when my mother was expecting me and so they uh, took a camp. My aunt had a camp in the Berlin Mountains so they spent the summer there. It wasn't until I was born um, that they moved into Rensselaer, bought a home in Rensselaer. There were uh, eight of us, eight children and um, very Catholic family. I was kind of a rebellious child. I, I was number six of eight. We were kind of poor, but we didn't know it. One of the Sisters of Mercy told me many years later, if I looked at all the Liptak girls, you would be the last one <laughs> that I would choose to go into the convent. It's interesting because my first assignment was um, in suburbia. I was there for 10 years. And then my second assignment was at a uh, rural community. And Altamont is right in the middle. It's not suburbia and it's not rural, but it has this, this village kind of atmosphere. The people are into the village, into the uh, village activities like the library, the firehouse. There's an ice cream shop in town and summer evening, you can see many people walking the village, so. Um, which you don't see in suburbia. Father Charlie was not well. He had uh, two open heart surgeries and was diagnosed with cancer. He was assigned here as pastor and uh, he started s saying things like, um, you're much too talented to be stuck up here in the hell towns. You know, you need to be in a bigger parish. And 
I used to say to him, why don't you mind your own business? <laughs> it's none of your business where I am. And, <laughs> and then he got really sick, so he had a plan. You run the parish, and I think it'll work, and I think it'll be great. And so it was really like his idea. When I became bishop in the diocese, there were over 300 active diocesan priests. When I retired, there was just over 100. And so as our numbers declined, we had to make the decision either to close or merge some parishes that were shrinking because of shifting population, or we had to find some other way of serving those parishes. And the Code of Canon Law does allow someone to oversee a parish as long as there is a canonical pastor. A sacramental minister takes care of doing the liturgies, those things that are reserved for the ordained. But the day-to-day -day work is done by the parish life director, and that person has the regular responsibilities for the spiritual and pastoral life of the parish. Sister Mary Lou had been serving as an associate in the parish. It was at that point that we had to decide whether we would have an ordained priest available or whether we would move in the direction of a parish life director. And we thought, given the rapport that she already had with the parish, that she would be the perfect person to move into that position. We never got any uh, inquiries from the Vatican about why are you doing this. But we were one of the first dioceses in the country to do this, and some dioceses still resist that. You know, and Sister Lou was one of our earliest parish life directors. Very quiet about it, too, because that's her nature. So, you know, she was doing this before other people were doing it. We've been fortunate with Bishop Hubbard for allowing us to have parish life directors. It was a new position, and uh, there's a job description for parish life directors, and then is a job description for sacramental ministers. I get the impression from some that it was difficult for the priest all of a sudden to be a sacramental minister mm -hmm. when they had been in charge of or administering as a pastor somewhere. Mm -hmm. I feel that she is the pastor. In Altamont, their, their um, experience with the priest wanted them to have another priest. And so there were a lot of people who didn't know how it was gonna work. It was interesting when Sister Lou first became part of our whole parish and a member of the congregation stood up and walked out. And I was aware that this person did that and they were pacing back and forth in the lobby, very upset. So this person commented on the fact that it was a sacrilege that she was up there. Why should that even be considered odd that we have a faith leader who's a woman? I, I'm, I, I'm blown away by that. Like, why should that be unusual? Why not? My predecessors uh, were great men who had the same vision. So it wasn't like, you know, we, we made a complete 180, you know, I mean, it, it was just a continuation of, of their vision for the church and my vision for the church. One lady came out quite upset. She said, I couldn't have my daughter listen to that anymore. And then my husband came out. Apparently my son had raised his hand. And he had said, no disrespect intended to the gentleman who had raised the point. But he said, I think most of the problem is that Sister Lou is a woman. Oh, you're a woman and you're in a leadership role. No, you're just in a leadership role. The gender didn't need to define you. The reality was that does take place. And it was hard for people to see that shift. Now, some people say a lot of people left church because of that. I've seen people leave churches all the time because a pastor leaves. They don't like the style of the new person, whether it be a man or a woman. I think it was more magnified because Lou is a woman. 
So what is it about this encounter that could have captured them so much? If there were more women in, I think, a larger role, that the Catholic Church as a whole could be more understanding and open. Something so big as the church, I don't think that it could change that quickly. So there has to be an evolution. I think Sister Lou is very resilient, just as we were speaking of all women religious. They know the rules. They know what they're getting into when they sign up. And yet they're trusting in the process. And you have to have patience and humility. And I do see Sister Lou as a person who is making things better. Sister Lou does have something very important to say, and she says it. You know, we want change and we want equality, and I think that is happening, but I don't, I don't think it can happen quickly because the customs, the traditions are so precious. We're in a tough transition, and I think the transition has been uh, difficult for parish life directors as well as sacramental ministers. I had this sister friend who had taught me in eighth grade. You know, we used to keep in touch. And so she said, uh, would you ever think about entering the community? So I said, oh, you know, I'm not thinking of it anymore. During high school, I felt a, a, a longing to learn more about uh, religious life and um, the life of the sisters that I knew. They seemed to be very peaceful and joyful and, you know, great teachers. I had a, an aunt that was a, a daughter of charity, my mother's sister, and she was a, a big figure in our family. She was always away, she was like in Baltimore, but Aunt Jen was like the person, you know, she was the go-to person. She was like, she was almost like a god in our family. You know? I would uh, visit family members, uh, my uncle in particular, at Christmas time, and I would be drinking Manhattans, you know, and I know they didn't have those in the convent, so. There weren't too many options for Catholic women in terms of, you know, being able to, to serve, and so I um, made arrangements and, and joined the Sisters of St. Joseph. So it was my mother kind of pushing, if you want to be a nun, you're going to be a daughter of charity. And then I got to know the Sisters of Mercy, you know, through school and stuff, and I thought, well, if I'm going to go in the convent, I'm going to enter the Sisters of Mercy. That didn't go over well with my mother. But. After talking with her again, just, you know, uh, inflamed that desire to, uh, I wanted to be like the sisters who taught me. I did choose to go in the convent then, and I uh, had no idea what it was like. I entered the religious congregation right after high school. Quite immature, quite naive, you might say. However, it fit. And then Vatican II happened. It was like a, a big explosion of, of opportunities. It was different for us because Vatican II had happened and some of the rules had, had eased up and it was baptism by fire. We entered one day and... They threw you into the life, and we went to college with other students. I pursued counseling psychology. Behavior therapy is if you change your behavior first. I realized as I got to college, they're not going anywhere, so I need to learn to face them head on. <laughs> but that's a perfect example of behavior therapy. I've taught uh, primarily graduate students preparing to become mental health counselors, aside from my academic life, and my specialty then was sex therapy. After uh, graduate school, I moved to Vermont. I started to work at Goddard College, which is where I met Mary Lou Liptek. Goddard College was known as a progressive school where, again, where students would do their own work, which attracted me to the school. But it wasn't conventional wisdom then in academia that that was OK. We were invited to go to Goddard for a weekend and to talk with as many mentors that, w that was on the campus. 
and um, to choose one to talk about our study. And so uh, I spoke to many uh, mentors on campus, and Ellen was the only one that I kind of connected with. The chair of my department told me that one of our new students was a nun, a Catholic nun, and would I be her advisor? And I said, I don't think so. I said, you know, I'm a Jewish atheist, and that's how I identified myself at the time, and I think that, I think it would really scare me. So um, she told me in the middle of the weekend that she had enough students and that she would not be able to uh, mentor me. As um, She was interested in it, but she uh, wasn't able to, to take it, uh, my study on. My picture of a nun at that point was black, yeah, <laughs> white and black and kind of unapproachable. And I heard all the scary things about nuns hitting kids with rulers on their knuckles. And I thought, oh, no, I couldn't do that. So um, I spoke with other mentors, and I just never found someone that I connected with. So I was going to go home. I was going to leave. Father Paul's a very special, very special priest. When I try to explain Father Paul to people, and I know people have their misconceptions about priests, what would Jesus do was the big like slogan and, you know, WWJD. And I, you know, for myself, I say, what would Father Paul do? He lives the life of poverty, not because you know, he has to or whatever, but he, he wants to, and I see his truck, and for him it's not what you drive, it's not the clothes you wear, it's not the house you live in or the job you have, it's who you are, and I think that is Father Paul. And I believe that wholeheartedly, that's how he lives his life, is that it's what you do, who you can help, who you can reach out to, and I know he's doing that every day. Albany County Jail, I go there on Mondays. I'm a chap on there, and you can't you can't get very theoretic with those guys because they they relate to life through tangible things. So I he is just the epitome of the Christian gentleman, and I think he kind of emulates in practice uh, the charism of Francis of Assisi. He's the perfect priest to to work with Sister Lou because of his incredible grace and humility and I don't know that this partnership would work with every priest. Um, he's extremely humble and deferential and has um, really left his checked his ego at the door. Not every priest would be comfortable with this dynamic. I taught at Maria College where there was a woman who was president and my boss I was a chaplain to separated and divorced and widowed people in the diocese, and my boss was a woman. So I had lots of instances where women were in charge, quite different from a lot of my brother priests. So when Mary Lou was appointed as parish life director, that was not terribly different for me. And, uh, you know, I was used to that kind of thing. And I feel fortunate that uh, I had good preparation for that. And so he readily agreed to serve as a sacramental ministry, and I think it's been a wonderful marriage there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Not literally, but... <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I think if there's a will, there's a way. If it was going to happen anywhere, it would happen here in Altima. This is a very cheesy tray, so... You're 
think we have eight adults. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Lou's at the pasta. Make sure you get Lou in, not Kathy. Lou. Now, there was a little Italy in my other parish that I ministered to. They were, they were all retired, homebound Italian women. When I went on communion calls, I'd start at the, this end of the street, and they would call down the street that I was there, and they would begin to prepare their best meals. So I ate my way down the street. <laughs> it was great. You don't have a picture of me, do you? I'm not afraid about the chicken, you're not afraid about the cooking part is, I just like the challenge of, of serving a lot of people and having it hot and having it good and not taste like it was institutional food. And I love the instant part of it, you know. I cooked it, it was good. People said it was good, they ate it, and the end. All right, so that's clean. I think stylistically they're different people. He very much lets Lou be in charge. The two of them uh, make an interesting pair. They, they both need each other. They both have found a way to break down the stereotypical way that a parish is run in such an effective way, um, an inspiring way, and it works. That is a basic thing about the Catholic Church, which is tradition. And I think that's what we pride ourselves on is like, this is what we do. We stand here, we sit here, we sing here. That is us. And that's okay. And I think some people see that as like, oh, you guys are like, you know, this is, you do the same thing. Stand, sit, stand, sit. But that's what we do and that's who we are. And I think we're okay with that. And I think evolution happens with generations. So you have, you know, my generation and Nick, and then you have my kids who are just, think, you know, Sister Lou's up there, and this is just how it is. So that's just that slow evolution. The evolution that we're in now, I think it's starting to really take hold. As a woman, I see the potential outcomes. During the um, investigation that Rome put on the sisters a, a few years ago, you know, people were really scared about that investigation. And I always said, let them investigate them. What are they going to find? They'll find that we're faithful and loyal and true and ministers and lovers. And that came out, you know, that people were outraged by that investigation and, and so much support surrounding uh, women religious throughout the United States. People came out and said what we have meant uh, to them and their life in the church, so it kind of backfired a little bit. I embraced it, the fact that Sister Lou was, you know, our, our parish life director. I didn't view it as unusual. And when you look at this almost could be like a small experiment, I and mean, we almost are a small, experiment, especially when you look at the priest shortage and that why that wouldn't be looked at as kind of a, a solution. We should be looking for ways to fill the church, but what I try not to do is then say, that is, then I'm done with it, and so um, I'm going to walk away. I could no more stop being Catholic than I could not be American. Uh, it's, it's part of who I am. Um, and. I know as I was growing up, my mom would sometimes explain to us, because we were at times upset about some of the issues that we didn't agree with. And my mom said, you know, if you're on a boat and it's starting to sink, you don't jump over and swim away. You stay in and you try to bail it out. And you work within to improve. If, if, if you love this, this mission, you stay with it. You don't abandon ship. I don't think leaving is the answer, it's never an answer. 
the person who's standing up in the middle is not the whole church and it's not your faith. My community is here. And so I draw my faith from the community that I come to every Sunday. I would not be happy if I didn't have to think a little and prod a little and um, problem solve a little and come to terms. I have recently learned of, of some women who are in the Catholic Church who are unsure about their feelings with the church and unsure what their role is and aren't going to church right now because they're unsure of it. What I would say to those women is to be strong and to have faith and to be the change. Rome wasn't built in a, in a day and, and you know, the, the Catholic Church cannot change in a year, you know, in, in five years. And I've seen the Vatican and I've seen Rome and I've seen so many things. And so at that point, I kind of understood. That kind of taught me a lot about why the Catholic Church is the way it is. Those old traditions, like it, it opened up a door for me in seeing the oldness and seeing that beauty in the old. But I think just by, just by being ourselves, being strong women, doing what's right, I think we're making that change. My study was the correlation between our spiritual side and our psychological side, our mental health. And so I think the study of looking into that correlation or connection, you know, we can't be really mentally sound unless we pay attention to our spiritual side. So I think that had an impact on her, the direction I was taking. So Sunday morning, I was uh, on my way to my dorm room, to write a letter saying that I was going to withdraw. And I met her on the way. I, I think we were about the same age. She was a bit younger than I, but, um, but you know, not, not a terrible amount younger. Um, I tried to dress like her today. So she was wearing blue jeans and a T-shirt. And she, the funniest thing to me was she had a comb in her back pocket. And the second I saw that comb, I knew I could work with her. And she said, you know, I've been thinking about your study, and it really kind of intrigues me. And... I'm going to take you on. I said, good, because I was on my way home. It just was such a stereotype breaker for me. She's a nun, and she had a comb in her back pocket. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I, I, really, that, that, uh, from that second, I knew I could work with her. And we started to talk, and I was just absolutely enthralled by her. I thought she was so interesting and out of the box. Here she was Jewish and an atheist and a sex therapist, and I was Catholic and celibate and, and a religious. 
I never felt it when I, I was with her or planning, but I, I thought it. Or someone who's... Catch up, go boy. He runs like a dog. Get out of there. She was Mary Lou Liptak, and she was a student at St. John's Academy in Rensselaer. And I was stationed there in uh, 1963. She would come after school. I was teaching her, you know, and she'd stop in after school and would talk and so forth. There were a lot of nuns, uh, you know, in the high school. We, we only had maybe one lay person teaching. So there were a lot of nuns. And they seemed to be all kind of old. Sister Pat came with a friend of hers, and they were the two young ones. We became friends. Um, uh, mostly because I was I was probably staying after school. <laughs> I don't know why, but then after she graduated from high school, she came to me. I, at that time, I was stationed at Mercy High School in Albany, and she came over and she said she thought she'd like to be a sister of Mercy. So she sponsored me. So yeah, didn't want to because she. I don't know. At first, when when I first told her, she told me to go to the Dominicans. <laughs> Why don't you go over to the Dominicans instead of the Mercies? But just to be a little facetious, I guess I, they were the Dominicans up the street from the Sisters of Mercy on Scotland Avenue, and they were a cloistered convent, uh, cloistered community, and so they never went out. And uh, so I said, well, why don't you join the Dominicans, you know, just to be funny. But uh, I don't think she would have lasted in a community that couldn't talk. So, And then through the years, uh, we've been in touch, kept in contact. And she kept saying, come on up and help me. And I said, oh, hello. Well. So uh, at this point, we lived together. We had never lived together before. And now she's my boss. <laughs> Yes, yeah, a big role reversal, right? <laughs> so we've been friends. I was I was just figuring it out when we were on vacation over fifty years. We need leaders who will stand up and do the right thing. Poverty and inequality are moral stains on our state. In our wealthy state of New York, this is morally unacceptable. Too many people in our local community and around the state cannot meet their basic needs of food, shelter, and clothing. My name is Sister Doreen Glynn. I'm a sister of St. Joseph of Carondelet, and I'm here today in the name of many, many of our sisters ministering in many parts of New York State. My involvement in social justice probably happened uh, in the 60s, you know, the civil rights, the war in Vietnam. I remember one document that I studied by the United States bishops, and the statement that they said in there, which is still so important to me, is Action on behalf of justice is a constitutive part of the gospel. You know, you cannot be a gospel living person, a person who embraces the gospel without being concerned about justice, about acting, you know, to bring about justice. So gradually, of course, that affected the decisions I was making, where I spent my time. So I attribute my commitment to justice, uh, to the gospel. Food, shelter, health care are human rights, human rights for all persons. If they're not privileges for a small number of lucky people. It is I think justice is just integral to everything that we do, everything that we do. And, and, and sometimes we're called to go down to the halls of Capitol, you know, or pick up the phone and, and call the governor or write the, the editorial or the letter to the editor, I should say. Jesus spoke the truth. He did not back down. Much of what is in the news is things like Simone Campbell and the nuns on the bus. Thank you so much. Currently, I'm the justice coordinator for the Sisters of St. Joseph of the Albany province. And I think that part of that role is to help 
the members of our of our province be involved, but it's also to collaborate with other groups. And I think what I do is I bring the face of the Sisters of St. Joseph. I am recognized as a member of our religious congregation, a member of the Catholic Church. I value that. So there's any number of, of groups that I belong to. The New Sanctuary for Immigrants, I've been involved with that group. And when there was a, a rapid response plea um, made to accompany uh, Eliza Martinez, who had an appointment at Homeland Security about her immigration status, we accompanied her and were there, you know, 28 years living in the United States, you know, raised five children who are uh, United States citizens and was being threatened about being deported. So there are people that would like to see us not in the halls of, of Congress and, and not, you know, in some of the ministries and concerns that we are involved in and would like us back in the habit. I think there was a time when we were depicted as immature and, you know, kind of frivolous if we were let out of the convent and, you know, and, uh, but I, I think that's I dissipated. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. One time in, in the sixth grade, there was a notice about the uh, PTA meeting. And so we took that note and we kind of changed the words around. You know, the principal was the head hood or the, the and, um, and one of the nuns found it and we got in trouble and the pastor got called in, the Monsignor. And um, so she was, you know, telling him what we did and, and so he said, I'll, I'll take care of it, sister. And when she left the room, he went. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew we had an in with him. In order for us to move forward as a church, we, we do need to celebrate and honor the gifts of, of, of both men and women. I do still find it distressing that in general, the discrimination against women in our church, that uh, they don't have a seat at the table in Rome, um, and that is distressing to me because I, I feel that is something I have to try to defend or justify to friends why I even stay in a church that, that disenfranchises more than half of its members. It's almost how we were back when we had such a hard time understanding interracial marriages, that we have such a strong opinion around same-sex marriages. And I know that that's, it is sad that I know a lot of people have left the church because of that. My own brother aspired to the religious life and entered the brotherhood, but found that it didn't give him the fulfillment that he thought he needed. And later on in life, he came to grips with the fact that he's homosexual. And that was concerning to me because of the church's outlook on that. I do have a few friends that are really upset about the homosexuality part of it. That smacks them in the face more. I never thought, after many years of doing this kind of thing, have to see that gender is such a huge wall and issue in our church. When in society it, it's there, and but it is huge in our church. And I don't, I don't want to wrap that up with God and say that's the way God wants it. I've been to a church where, you know, I was put down as a Catholic, and I don't think the pastor knew that I was a Catholic in the audience, but I was put down as one. And I was with my mom, and we were put down blatantly, like, the problem with this is the Catholics, 
And I remember leaving that church with my mom and I think we both got in the car and we just both started crying. I think we just left and we got in the car and cried because it was just very, very sad. I come from a family with limited means. We had to make do, so I learned as a child uh, how to do that. I am a collector, too much so sometimes. I have to be careful of that, and I need friends around me who are going to confront me about uh, what I'm carrying around in the back of my vehicle. When friends of mine in Altamont we built the bed and checked out the frame a few years ago. It was a real revitalization. But Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. He knew the family and Lazarus died. And Jesus was kind of slow in going to the family when he found out of his his death. Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, were very clear that if he had been there, the brother would not have died. They asked him, can you do, can you do something? And he went, he went out to the gravesite. Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come out. And uh, when he came out, all the kind of bonding that they had around his body had to be removed. So it was a visible sign of transition from death to life. It's very helpful having a usable truck with an eight-foot bed, and uh, that's been rebuilt by caring people, and uh, it never says no. Arbor Hill is a very diverse place. There are sections of Arbor Hill that are more challenging than others. A small group of us bring some food that will be needed. Mainly, I bring in baked goods from supermarkets. Sometimes the older adults would tease me and, and tell me that I'm messing up their neighborhood by bringing my old truck in. We usually feed about a hundred. He always brings uh, uh, the cakes and bread. For the most part, he does. But he always stays and have a plate. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> she begs to ride in it, and I said, you've got to qualify. You can't just ride in it. You know, there's firewood on the back of it. I can always chop it up. <laughs> it defaces the earth. Jealousy takes very extreme forms, and I'm used to that. Right, I have know. to be really hard up to be jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of a gentleman and I noticed that he was underdressed for the winter. And I knew him well enough by then to ask, do you, do you have a heavy coat? Because I knew he worked outdoors when he could. And he was honest and said, I do not have that. And I had received a heavy winter coat from a man who was about his size and I just was able to give it to him the following week. It was very much an instrument for friendships amongst us. When I was uh, counseling parishioners and, uh, and others, inevitably, at the end of our counseling time together, the client would always mention 
God or their spiritual side. Not for my prompting, but, and I thought, what is that? What is, why is that? So I wanted to look into it further. Do you think of yourself as sort of like contrary? I guess the steady part of everything I've done, it's about women and women's mental health and the psychology of women. I, I think that's the sort of the, the glue in my professional life. Back in the day when I was her advisor, we, it was before computers, it was in the early 80s, before personal computers anyway, and uh, she, it, it was an, a program for adult students, and so students would come to the campus every three weeks for a weekend, a long, intense weekend, and then in between weekends, they would write papers and do work and mail them, believe it or not, mail them, snail mail them. And then I, I just was my impish self with her. You know, um, I would write a paper... And then I would offer her, um, you know, just to be impish, because that's how I am, you know, uh, the peace of Jesus, because she was Jewish. She would always sign her letters, I wish you the peace of Jesus. So here I am, a Jewish girl, and, and you, I, I mean, I, I, no one ever said that to me before. I wish you the peace of Jesus. But she would write comments on, on, um, in the margins, oh my God. So occasionally she would write something that really stood out for me. And, and I remember on one occasion I wrote, um, oh, my God, in, in the margins. And I would write back, you know, be careful, God might answer you. At that point, I think religion and spirituality weren't words that I really used in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I identified myself really, really very loosely as a Jewish atheist. And culturally, I'm... Um, that's very important to me, to have a Jewish heritage. So, you know, we had that kind of relationship. It was funny, but she always made me think. Does mom do it? Yeah. Oh, why? Stop. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> no, I, 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 No, you don't. Sorry. All right, ready? Uh, <laughs> Christian, you want to pull it out? Yes. Yeah, pull the dough out. Like that, yeah. Yeah, pull it out. Can I help you? Oh my gosh. Cool. Everybody's name Josh. It is now in our table. Amen. 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 Everyone has a calling. I tried to emphasize that to people when they talk about, well, you're kind of special, you know, you're a nun. No, 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 no. Everyone's special. Everyone has a calling. And I think, you know, that our goal in life is to bring us to become who we are, who God made us. We, we have a lot of baggage that we pack on through, you know, experiences in life and relationships. And, uh, and our ultimate goal is to become that person that God made us. I like the direction that I took, you know, it's, it, it fits me and, um, and, it, and it means a lot, but so does everybody else. I was at school with the kids and I was working and this little girl said, why are you always here at school? And I said, well, because I, you know, I'm able to stay home and I, so I can always come in and volunteer. She said, well, why do you stay home? And, you know, it was like an eight-year-old girl and I was kind of like, yeah, why do I stay home? And I had this like, I was kind of offended that she was, you know, she was questioning why I stay home. It is not a glamorous role when I'm with people and I, they say, oh, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I stay at home with my kids and well, what do you do for a job? And I was like, well, I have a lot to do as a job. You know, that is my job. It's my full-time job. So it is a journey, and I'm definitely still growing in it. Can you go over top of covers? Especially now, I think that good people, good kids in the world is, is everything. I don't like the term stay-at-home mom. I don't know. I think there needs to be a better term. I think it's sort of like nun, sister, sort of has that connotation. I think like stay-at-home mom has that kind of connotation too of what people think a stay-at-home mom is. I think the experiences in my role has really allowed me to relate to like Sister Lou and how many of us can rise to that level of sacrifice.
I've always wanted to get scripture or spirituality in the ordinary, so any conversation I have, any experience I've had is fodder for one of my reflections. Uh, because I try to tie it into ordinary life. When I was a kid growing up in Rensselaer, we did a lot of playing out in the yard. In fact, we were not allowed to go out of the yard. We spent a lot of time, really, whole summers, and it seems to me, looking back, that there were plenty of things to keep us busy. Now, there was an Italian family that lived on this next street up. Three or four times a day, the mother would literally hang out of her back porch window on the second floor and call her children's names. So when she called, we would yell, what? And she would yell back, would time for lunch. Us that it was she time for lunch. And we would yell, and back, we would yell back, no, we're not coming home. You know, to get them in trouble. So now I'm sure that this Italian woman knew after a while that we were not her kids. But looking back, it was great fun trying to trick her, answering someone else's call or believing in the possibility that we could. You refer them to someone who is more, like, better equipped for that conversation. Like, if you're uncomfortable with it. My mantra, or sort of what keeps me going in the world, is tikkun olam, and it means change the world. I started college in 1958, and girls did not become professionals then. My parents told me, I should I major like in like early education or nursing or become a secretary because that's what women did. When I moved to Alaska, there were three full professors in my department, two men and myself at that point. And I found out a couple of years later that I was making substantially less money than the two men in my department, even though my credentials were better, my experience was longer. And I went running down to the dean's office when I found out, and I was furious. And he said to me something that I will never forget. He said to me, oh, I didn't think you'd care. What do we want? Equal pay! What do we want? Equal pay! What do we want? Now! The rich man loves his money. There ain't no doubt about that. He gets crabby because he ain't happy when the profits ain't too fat. Now any old way he can make it, gonna be all right. There's, there are two thoughts in, in my field, in psychology, and there is one branch that really diminishes gender differences and really thinks that men and women are, are similar, and it's, it's culture and society that holds women back. And then there's another branch of my field that feels that women are, we're psychologically different, we're socially different. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. I think there is something that women have that's quite different. And it's, it's so cool. Together, we will ensure our voices are heard as we continue to stand up for women's rights and equality. New York is providing a roadmap for everyone in the country to follow. And together, we can all make it happen. Thank you. <laughs> The Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet trace their origin to southern France around the year 1650. We really had the, the spirituality that we were able to do all things that women are capable of doing, that we were founded for that, to love the dear neighbor without distinction. We were flourishing at that time, and then came the French Revolution, and some of our sisters were sent to the guillotine. We established a lot of schools, orphanages, hospitals, did uh, 
work in prisons. My spirituality called me not to, not to separate myself from the world, but rather to be engaged in the world and to find the presence of God there. Today's gospel is also about being called, and I thought when I was reflecting on this reading that it might be a good idea for all of us to consider our own call. Our own call. To reflect on what it means to be called. When we moved here, we were in the market for finding a church, and the town of Altamont sounded familiar, so we looked it up and found a map and drove down and just went to a service. Certainly what Sister Lou does just in her role attracted me to the church so that my daughter could see a woman running a church capably and I walked out of there saying we found our church. I have no reservation about a woman being in charge of a community like this that we ought to give her the full panoply of how she can serve. I'm not talking about when I decided to enter the convent to become a Sister of Mercy, or when you decided whom to marry or your occupation, the time when you knew that God loved you so much that you were changed, changed, reformed, converted by that love, and that you would never be the same again. People would be surprised that that you're a Catholic, you know, you you stand for women's rights and you stand for equality and you, you know, you, you are open to different people and different religions and you know it was just like well that's who I am as a Catholic you know and that's my churches my churches have always been that openness that you would have to speak up for the downtrodden that you would have to speak up and out against injustices I think feminism you know to the extreme has gotten a bad name but I think feminism in the in the best sense of the word is we're empowering a whole half of our population to rights and to privileges and that we have in the past kind of just accepted as, as we're second class. Sister Lou's role in our church shows an evolution. The world sees the Catholic Church as dominated by men. Just like in any job, there is no reason why women can't do what a man does in the Catholic Church. You know, especially when I look at my daughter, she doesn't know any different. And so I'm hoping that she walks away with having such a positive role model in a leadership role. In children's literacy, we do a lot of acting the readings out. And so people have to take different roles. And who would want to be Jesus? You know, the girls are raising their hand. I said, great, you can. And so it was never, and no, no, the boys didn't say, oh, no, you can't be Jesus. Because we focus on what does Jesus do, not the gender. We always do better if we surface and talk about the things that seem to divide us. And my position is, I think we desperately need equality symbols in our church. In in terms of closing the gap and promoting gender equality, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is that we need to keep educating women about the power of their voice. So I think it starts with educating young children. I think education is the key, educating young girls to be powerful and to have the the courage and the confidence to speak their mind. And that will carry them through the rest of their lives. But whatever you decide, spend some time reflecting on your call this week. week. Because your call is as unique as you are, and nobody but you can answer it.
I presented her with her diploma when she got her master's degree, because advisors do that, and we say something about our students when we present them. But I also talked about her impact on me. I thanked her for really helping me become a more spiritual person, recognize that part of myself. I began to respect nuns. I began to respect the Roman Catholic Church. I've never called myself an atheist since then. I realize I'm a spiritual person, and I learned that from her. And that was very moving for me. And, and I actually think it was for her, too. You know, I was kind of speechless, so I, I, I didn't really say anything to her um, at the end of uh, that weekend, graduation weekend. So I went home, and I, um, I wrote her a letter. What was in that letter? Yeah, I should have brought it. I'd read it now. Just, um, I guess, just um, you know that I, I that I always saw her spirituality. You know, it's always been my goal, my in my religious life, to to make um, God kind of ordinary. You know, in, in my childhood, in when I was uh, raised in the church, God was always kind of big and out there and, and fearful. And I always wanted to make God um, normal and ordinary and part of our lives. It doesn't matter what, what road you take. Everyone has that direction that they're moving towards God. Therefore, as we celebrate this memorial, of his death and resurrection. We offer you, Lord, the bread of life.
my name.